Welcome to our seminar on the next phase of the biodiversity reforms in New South Wales. Welcome back to those of you who came to the last seminar we had here when the bills were being discussed. Uh, and I'd once again like to thank McCabe's for their generously hosting us today and providing such a beautiful venue and some food. I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the land of the Gadigal people, of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. So what we want to cover today, quick refresher of what is the new legislative architecture that we're going to be working with, what exactly is on exhibition. Nari will be going into the relevant regulatory aspects of the offset scheme, the urban vegetation set and, and more detail about urban areas. I'm going to identify some key regulatory details around rural native vegetation management and we want to leave plenty of time for questions. And we're happy to take questions on notice if there's a technical question we can't follow up with today. Um, but we'll certainly, we'll certainly do our best. We are going to put these slides on our website later today if you don't want to feverishly right now. And we'll also be putting our submission up early as well to assist. So in terms of where we're up to, as you can see from this timeline, the legislative architecture was passed last year, so what we're now working with is the regulatory detail that will support the new scheme. So it's important to note that the focus is now on these details and some of the substantive problems that remain with the scheme would actually require legislative amendments to fix. Um, and so at this stage we're just looking at the regulatory detail, but we're bearing in mind some of the issues that we've identified all along, some of the concerns about this reform process. Uh, we'll, we'll note our ongoing concerns with the scheme, especially in terms of actually being able to deliver biodiversity outcomes, but we're just going to focus on the regulatory detail and some opportunities of where we can tighten and clarify things at this stage. So just as a reminder uh, to you, these are the key components of the new regime. The two acts up the top uh, were passed by Parliament last year, as I said, so they're not open to further amendment at this stage. Although if you read through the many documents uh, on exhibition at the moment, there are some references to potential future legislative amendments down the track. The consultation phase we're now in is looking at the detail of the other components, particularly the biodiversity assessment method, the BAM, the codes, maps, regulations and the new SEP. Um, and if you note on the timeline back a slide, it actually has a stated start date of the 25th of August. So there's not actually too much time between when exhibition closes and this regime is going to kick off. And there's actually a fair bit of detail still missing from this regime, so there will be further consultation after the scheme commences on that detail that's still yet to be decided. So in terms of what's on exhibition, again we find ourselves in the position of having to get across hundreds of pages of technical documents in six weeks. So we've got three regulations, a code, an assessment tool, an accreditation scheme, technical mapping, an offsets calculator and various other guidance materials. So at EDO, we're going to be putting in a submission on, that will cover each of these different elements and we currently have members of our expert and technical panel who are helping us with things like the calculator and the assessment methodology <coughs> and so on. Now, um, through the course of this reform, I have given some fairly depressing speeches about the fate of biodiversity in New South Wales, so I thought I would actually identify some of the potential strengths of this scheme up front. Um, the big hope for us is that the funded private land conservation program is going to deliver some terrific outcomes for biodiversity in certain parts of New South Wales. This is as distinct from the offsets market. There is a lot of money that could move to great public stewardship on private land and we absolutely strongly support that. Uh, we support a no net loss standard for biodiversity assessment methods and we, we support the requirement that proponents must avoid and minimise impacts before they step to the offsetting stage. The new information on exhibition has more criteria for areas of outstanding biodiversity value, including uh, taking into account 
you know, climate resilience and so forth, which is promising. Nari will talk about that a bit more, I think. Um, there's a new category in the mapping of sensitive mapped lands. So this will actually exclude code-based clearing, which we think is a positive thing. Uh, there'll be a repeatable scientific method, so there will actually be more consistency in how biodiversity is assessed. There's an accreditation system and a code of conduct for assessors that we support. There are some compliance tools and a biodiversity monitoring system. And there are a few miscellaneous clauses that we actually support, for instance, in regarding interactions with wildlife. You know, some of the regulatory gaps have been filled about approaching dugongs, the use of dr drones near whales and so forth. So there are bits and pieces in the new scheme that we do support in some of this detail. However, I wouldn't be true to myself if I didn't also note there are some serious weak weaknesses. Uh, we've never supported the repeal of the Native Vegetation Act and the environmental standards that went with that. So, as I said in the last seminar, we are getting rid of the Maintain or Improve Biodiversity Values Test. Um, and th there's a, a shift from property vegetation planning to clearing under codes that we'll go into today. There's the heavy reliance on flexible and indirect offsets that Nari will talk about further. And there are actually weaker standards uh, in the biodiversity assessment method and for biocertification. The conservation gains from this new scheme aren't actually guaranteed in law. They're highly dependent on political funding decisions. Uh, there is a lot of discretion built into this new regime. And there's a lot of decision makers too, because you've got OEH, DPI, local land services, a new vegetation pa panel, as well as local council. So it's a bit unclear how the bodies will all fit together. And if you look at the operating context here, we have over a thousand species already listed as threatened and an ever-increasing intensity of cumulative threats. There's a significant risk of policy failure apparent in these details of the new scheme. Many of the details on exhibition now indicate a really strong focus on getting an offsets market up and running. So the focus is actually on the market efficiency rather on, than on a goal of conserving and recovering unique biodiversity. So we're going to discuss these issues further in terms of what the regulatory detail is proposed and what could potentially be improved. So we'll start with offsets, the new set, and vegetation in urban areas. So I'm going to take you through the um, draft uh, biodiversity conservation regulation and some of the key components of it. And I realise that there's uh, probably a lot of different interests in the room that might want to zero in in your submissions on different parts of the regulation. So um, uh, part two deals with protecting animals and plants and the licensing scheme for that. Um, part three, which I'll go into, about uh, is about areas of outstanding biodiversity value and the criteria that will apply there. There's criteria for listing um, threatened species and ecological communities. There's a section on private land conservation. Uh, there's quite a lot of detail on how the biodiversity offset scheme will work under part six, which I'll go into, uh, as well as how that interacts with the approvals under the planning system in part seven. Um, Biocertification um, of large areas of land is dealt with under part eight. Uh, we've got a bit of information on um, engagement with the community and um, transparency of information on public registers at part nine. And the last parts of the regulation um, are a miscellaneous range of issues such as um, how the Biodiversity Conservation Trust will set out its plans and reports, uh, some regulatory compliance detail, uh, information on um, a new Biodiversity Outlook reporting system which could hold some promise, uh, and a range of delegations um, for powers under the Act. And uh, if you're interested in things like penalty notices, um, uh, those are listed at Schedule 1 of the regulation, and some detail on the Biodiversity Conservation Advisory Panel is at Schedule 2. And fortunately, we won't have to cover all of this in the next um, 20 minutes. We'll just be focusing on a few key areas that I thought might be of interest. So areas of outstanding biodiversity value, um, the draft regulation sets out the criteria for listing these new areas uh, and this will replace critical habitat uh, which has been underutilised in the current system, there's only four areas declared. So they'll be carried over to the new system and they will be, and um, the criteria will be expanded for these new areas. So 
Um, they need to be of state, national or global significance and um, make a significant contribution to a range of science-based um, criteria. So they have a very high threshold for listing, um, but we do see some positive recognition not only of the critical habitat as exists now, but also uh, climate refuges, the resilience and connectivity of um, species and, and threatened species, as well as significant areas for um, education and, um, and scientific research, or really significant areas, I suppose. Uh, so it is a significant positive in the new system, we think, uh, but it really depends on um, how it's utilised in practice, how many areas are, um, are put forward and declared by the Environment Minister. So in a similar way to critical habitat, it's really a bit, a bit, a bit discretionary. Some areas for improvement for these um, AOBVs, well there's no formal public nomination process, so unlike uh, the threatened species listing process where it sets out a clear process for that. Um, we don't see that here, so that is something the regs could add, um, as well as um, there's a lack of time frames as to you know how long these areas might take to assess. So they could sit on a shelf and not be um, decided on, which is a, a risk that we've, we've seen emerge in other areas. Um, and as well, I guess we need to think about interim protection of those areas once they're nominated. So uh, if there's a period between nomination and declaration, it would be good to, to see some interim protection to ensure that those um, areas um, are not cleared before they can be declared as um, really significant areas. So I'll spend a bit of time talking about the biodiversity offsetting scheme and how that works. So uh, the Act introduces a new um, biodiversity assessment method, um, which uh, as some of you may be um, familiar uh, with the biobanking scheme, uh, calculates loss or gain of um, native vegetation and, and habitat loss uh, and calculates that as uh, biodiversity credits, <coughs> i.e. offsets. Um, now obviously uh, biodiversity credits is a kind of positive term but you can think of it from the other way around that we're really talking here about an ecological debt and it's a question of um, how that debt is to be repaid, who's responsible for repaying it and is the price paid or the, the conservation gains equivalent in ecological terms, not just equivalent to a number on a page or a, a, a set dollar value. Uh, so these BAM reports will be required for many New South Wales um, uh, development types, so uh, virtually all state significant development and state significant infrastructure, at least if it affects threatened species, uh, as well as local development that meets a particular threshold that's set out um, in the Act and regulations. So um, in brief, the, um, the threshold for applying the BAM um, relates to the, the area that's being cleared. So for example, 0.25 to 2 hectares of clearing uh, may trigger the BAM, or it could be any area of clearing where that, that land is listed on a sensitive values map, um, which is, uh, there's a, a demonstration map that's out for consultation. But we understand that will go live um, as soon as the system commences. <coughs> In relation to um, part five, local infrastructure type activities, um, it will be up to the proponent to opt in um, to the BAM scheme, otherwise they'll proceed uh, as they do now under the current planning system. So overall the BAM, um, the biodiversity assessment method, will largely replace the existing threatened species assessments and uh, biodiversity offsetting methods that we see being used under the Planning Act at the moment. And um, but um, impacts that are on um, other aspects of the environment, like pollution and so on, they will still be considered um, under existing methods as well. So let's turn to serious and irreversible impacts. Um, so the Act um, says that serious and irreversible impacts on biodiversity need to be refused for local projects, but they're only a further consideration for major projects and biocertification. Um, and that's to be determined in the opinion of the consent authority. So the regulation on exhibition identifies principles uh, for um, determining whether a serious and irreversible impact will occur. Uh, so it relates to being um, likely to contribute significantly to the risk of a threatened species or ecological community becoming extinct. Uh, and that's because of various scientific criteria that are set out in those principles. And there's additional guidance from the Office of Environment and Heritage as to what those criteria are and, and how those principles should be applied. So in other words, serious and irreversible impact is a very high bar, uh, but the regulation is a chance to suggest 
additional impacts that you think should be considered serious and reversible or additional considerations. <coughs> so for example, um, the consideration of cumulative impacts could be additional um, to what is included at the moment. The risk of not just extinction, but the risk of the species being uplisted into a more threatened category could be um, something that should be considered. Um, and also um, soil, water and salinity impacts that are serious and irreversible, um, which is not currently listed at the moment. Got a question there? Um, yeah, That's a really good question, and I think um, I'm not actually aware what the um, what the scale of extinction referred to there is. So, have you seen something that says it's bioregional, or is that just a question that you're I, unsure I, about? I tapped in on the webinar yesterday. And the okay. Suggestion from the webinar yesterday was that it's only it's going to be extinct <coughs> in the bioregions. Yeah. Local extinction is completely fine. Yeah, yeah. I, that would that would make sense, and you know, because it was unclear, it could. Without clarification, it could mean extinct in Australia, it could mean extinct in New South Wales, it could mean extinct in the bioregion. So that does need to be clarified, and obviously the tighter that requirement is, um, the better from the perspective of, of the community and you know, local biodiversity protection. So, yeah, really good issue to raise. Um, so how does the proponent meet their offset scheme obligations? Um, well, the draft regulation sets out the offset rules for proponents to compensate for the impacts that are identified in the BAM. Um, so these options include, um, in any combination of the following, retiring like-for-like -like biodiversity credits, retiring credits under the variation rules, uh, funding an action uh, to benefit the species or ecological community that is impacted, so they're indirect, um, what you might call indirect offsets or supplementary measures. Um, there is a requirement that those actions, at least for proponents, will need to be listed in the BAM, but we haven't seen a, an actual list yet, so that's still to be determined. Um, and then the last couple of options are um, mine site rehabilitation, which we have strong concerns about in terms of the scientific integrity of doing that. Uh, and finally, the ability to pay into the Biodiversity Conservation Fund instead of buying credits or um, you know, <coughs> upfront offsets. So we do have a range of significant concerns about um, you know, from the variation rules down. The fact of the matter is the Act has been passed now and um, these are the options available. So I guess now is the time to um, look at what safeguards can be put around some of, these, uh, some of these options to ensure that the offset scheme and the biodiversity assessment scheme um, has as much integrity as possible. So the draft regulation goes on, um, so it basically restates what the Act allows and then it sets out like-for-like um, -like offset rules, um, the circumstances in which those rules can be varied or weakened um, if offset, if like-for-like -like offsets aren't available. Um, and that the reg provides for ancillary rules that are yet to be developed, but it, it lists a range of things that um, those will cover, including standards for mine rehabilitation and exclusions of certain species from um, the variation rules, which again is another key area that you might want to um, you know, propose exclusions for. Um, so the like-for-like -like rules, and I'm not going to go through the detail today, um, but they are pretty technical, but um, they're quite a broad interpretation of like-for-like. -like. Uh, so for example, for certain species that can't be predicted by their vegetation habitat, um, certain threatened species, such as the koala or the squirrel glider, um, you can offset the same species anywhere in New South Wales. So if you're um, destroying koala habitat on the Liverpool Plains, you can potentially offset that uh, for koalas in um, the south of New South Wales. Um, and then we get to the variation rules. So um, I guess the problem here is that um, variation rules fundamentally weaken like-for-like -like principles or the offsets um, equivalents that we think is required in an offset scheme. Um, so we've said all along that like-for-like -like offsets are absolutely fundamental. Uh, the peer reviewers of the, um, the draft BAM in 2015 uh, expressed concerns that weak offset rules could undermine the price signal in the offsets market. Um, in other words, that scarce biodiversity would be undervalued and the price paid would not be sufficient. Um, but nonetheless, this is the scheme that we'll be, we'll be working with. So 
Um, what do the variation rules require? Well, first, uh, the proponent needs to take reasonable steps to obtain like-for-like -like credits. So that includes things like checking the credits available register, um, um, adding yourself to the list of credits wanted, and talking to potential stewardship site um, landowners to see if you can um, get those credits. Um, but this is also a chance for you to suggest other steps that should be required before proceeding to the variation rules. Um, and it's important to note that there are slightly different rules that will apply to uh, developers or rural landholders on one hand compared with the rules that apply to the Biodiversity Conservation Trust that will be um, uh, spending money under the fund uh, and, and different rules as well for strategic biocertification which is a, a high level um, certification scheme which we'll talk about. Um, and again, just underlining that OEH can exclude impacts on certain species and communities, so if you um, want to suggest that, um, it's worth putting that in your submission. Um, so these slides will be on, on the web, so I won't um, go into the detail again, but um, I guess it's worth uh, pointing to, um, again, the species credit species down the bottom there, that um, a, you can basically substitute a plant for a plant or an animal for an animal that is at equal or higher risk of extinction in the same or nearby sub-region. So for example, um, koala, uh, impacts on koalas could be offset by protecting the squirrel gliders under the variation rules, which doesn't really make a great deal of well, scientific well, sense. Quick clarification. Uh, sub-region, is that Ibra regions? Uh, it's below Ibra regions. Right. Okay. So uh, let's go on to biocertification. So um, what is biocertification? It's a scheme that already allows um, the large-scale upfront assessment of biodiversity values of, you know, for example, a new suburb for greenfield development, um, an example being the Western Sydney Growth Centres uh, under the current Act. Um, so biocertification of a large area removes the need for further project-by-project -project biodiversity assessment at the site scale. So how will it change under the new Act? Well, the Act expands biocertification to allow private developers to access um, biocertification rather than just government planning authorities. So that could be in an urban or a rural context, which you might want to bear in mind. It will adopt a lower environmental standard than the current test. So we're, um, as Rachel said at the start, we're removing the concept of maintain or improving environmental outcomes. Uh, and we're moving to that, you know, try and avoid serious and irreversible impacts. So really from a positive standard to a uh, really low and, and concerning standard. Um, there'll also be, as I mentioned, a new strategic category of biocertification that will allow um, looser offsetting rules for planning, that's for planning authorities only. Um, and the draft regulations set out some criteria for the minister to consider when uh, they are, you know, whether, whether to declare a biocertification application as strategic or not. Uh, but they're not hugely informative, those criteria. So if you've got additional uh, things that you think should be considered uh, when, you're, when you're doing a kind of high-level strategic assessment, um, then you may want to um, look at that part of the regulation and make some comments. So for example, uh, while it refers to things like you know, looking at the existing regional plan and, um, and considering the triple bottom line outcomes of biocertification, there's no specific environmental criteria like um, considering the principles of, of ecologically sustainable development. So the precautionary principle, intergenerational equity, uh, conservation of biodiversity as a fundamental consideration. Um, and then before I um, hand over to Rachel, I just want to talk a bit about the proposed vegetation uh, SEP. So that's a state environmental planning policy. Uh, and this will apply in urban and environmental zones. Um, so, um, under the proposed SEP, the Native Vegetation Panel um, or the Local Council will assess clearing applications in these urban and, and environmental zones, depending on the size of the clearing um, and depending whether the band threshold um, is triggered, so that area threshold or the, the sensitive values threshold. Um, so what is the purpose of this SEP? Well, it's to address the impact of incremental clearing and to fill a regulatory gap that might otherwise occur. So um, we know that in rural zones, the Local Land Services Act and the codes and so on will apply. Um, we know that if a development application is required, if, if council needs to give development consent, then that's the, the assessment pathway. But for things 
things outside those rural zones of the things underneath the, the development consent requirements, that clearing could otherwise not be captured by um, the new biodiversity assessment method unless this step is enacted. So that's the gap that it's trying to fill. So an example where, um, where the purpose of clearing doesn't require development consent and therefore this set would apply would be extensive agriculture in, in, in certain environmental zones, um, which is um, seen in a number of, of LEPs. And from memory, I think um, the government's E-Zone review, they did a review of E-Zones in the North Coast and um, that proposed that extensive agriculture should be allowed uh, by default in um, certain environmental zones. So um, even if it's not allowed in, in your local area at the moment, say in the Blue Mountains, um, if that sort of policy were to be carried out, um, you know, that, that could also be allowed um, in LEPs. So that's when this set would, <coughs> would kick in. Um, in other words, so if um, land clearing in urban or environmental zones exceeds the biodiversity offsets threshold, um, either you know because of the area of clearing or um, because the site is mapped um, as a sensitive value, um, then the biodiversity assessment method will apply. Uh, the proponent would need to avoid, minimise and offset the impacts. Um, and the native vegetation panel um, would apply the decision criteria that are listed under the the Local Land Services Act, um, uh, because remember planning consent <coughs> is not required under the Planning Act. Um, now if clearing is underneath the ban threshold, there's still um, the uh, ability for councils to regulate that through their development control plans or their tree protection orders, and those will be carried over into the new scheme and you know there'll be a transition period, um, and then um, council DCPs will um, I guess need to conform with the requirements of the vegetation set. But in a sense, this is an opportunity if you're interested in, in this sort of thing, um, or if you've got experience in, in local councils, um, to think about how could um, council DCPs and permitting systems be improved, um, in your opinion. Excuse me, how does this fit with the 1050? Um, that's a good question, and maybe I'll, I'll deal with that in a moment. Um, so, um, so just to, to fill you in on what's on exhibition, um, so there's just an explanation of intended effect at the moment. There's no draft you know, legal provisions, uh, but nevertheless, it, it gives you an idea of what the government's proposing. Um, and it's worth noting that clearing that's, that's allowed under existing SEPs, so let's say the exempt and compliant development SEP or the significant precinct SEP, that will all continue in the background. So this SEP is not going to replace or override those. Um, but the yeah the existing um, standard LEP clauses um, um, that relate to tree clearing will be absorbed into this into this set. Um, so the government is consulting on the details now and asking a range of questions in their um, in their explanation. Um, they're saying should, for example, should native vegetation panels um, delegate um, uh, clearing assessment in urban and e zone areas to local councils. Um, should all clearing above the ban threshold um, require a development consent instead of being assessed under the, um, the new local land services system? Um, and so, you know, then it might be a question of comparing the different decision making requirements in Section 79C of the Planning Act versus um, the, um, the considerations for the veg panel. Um, and uh, they're also asking should the set set out mandatory exemptions to allow certain clearing? And that probably goes to your question. Um, we think there's there's a risk of perverse outcomes to standard exemptions across the state under um, yeah. uh, under this step, and for the reasons that, that perhaps you were alluding to, which is the misuse of the 1050 bushfire code that was um, you know used to clear for people's views rather than for the purpose that it was passed, which is to protect from bushfire. Um, so that's a, a quick tour of the biodiversity conservation regulation and the related tools. Um, we'll now switch mindsets a little bit and move to the uh, from the urban to the rural context and Rachel's going to talk about the native vegetation regulation. Thanks Nari. So the key instruments that will determine clearing of native vegetation in, on rural land are the amended local land services regulation, the codes and the maps. The instruments that will facilitate conservation and management of native vegetation on private land are the clauses of the new biodiversity conservation regulation. So the amended 
LLS regulation on exhibition. It includes a lot of provisions regarding the mapping, so I'll talk about that next, particularly recategorising mapped land. It talks about the framework for code-based clearing and some more detail around the panel uh, when they can approve clearing not otherwise authorised by codes or allowable activities. And it's also got one new offence provision regarding contravening requirements of approvals or certificates. So there are some provisions worth supporting in the, in the LLS reg, especially the sensitive regulated land category that I'll talk about shortly. But also, for example, uh, the vegetation panel can stop the clock and require further information on the application and there's no deemed approval if the three member panel does not make a decision in 90 days. There's still some detail missing. For example, the final full list of allowable activities is still to be confirmed, as is the assessment method for grasslands, for example. How the new scheme will work is highly dependent on accurate and comprehensive mapping. The documents on exhibition provide a bit more detail on the mapping categories. So you might remember from when we had this, this debate last time, the uh, excluded land will be identified in grey, so that's urban areas, national parks, they're not in the rural land clearing scheme. The blue areas, that's category one, that's exempt land, so that's largely land that's already cleared and that will re require no approval to do clearing on blue land. So category two is where the, the details will really come into play, this is regulated <coughs> land. So this land, uh, the yellow land can be cleared under a code or with approval. Uh, and one of the new developments on the, in the materials that are now on exhibition is a new category of sensitive regulated land. So this includes environmentally sensitive areas such as high value grasslands, core koala habitat, critically endangered plants or communities, Ramsar wetlands, land subjected to remedial action and land funded by conservation programs and so on. And the, the important thing about this new category is code-based clearing is excluded from it. You still have a development application to clear it, but at least it's putting a limit on the code-based clearing. So actually getting this mapping right is pretty important. This is a, a submission opportunity to really e expand the category of where codes can be excluded, I think. Um, for example, expand this ca the category of sensitive land to include other areas that really shouldn't be subject to co-based clearing, like travelling stock reserves, for example, if you think about the biodiversity values there. Um, and as we've said all along and repeatedly, <coughs> code-based clearing should not apply to high-risk communities like endangered ecological communities. So we'll be saying that again here. It's really an opportunity to try and limit where code-based clearing can happen and it's really important to try and get this mapping accurately, as accurate as possible. The amended regulation has a lot of detail on these categories and the process for recategorising, so how you would then get your yellow land to be converted to blue so it no, no longer requires any approval. Uh, and some detail about what will happen in the transitional period while the mapping is incomplete. Uh, as I noted at the beginning on the timeline, this scheme is to kick off on the 25th of August and the transitional provisions say if the mapping's not complete, a land holder will decide if their land is blue or yellow. We think this is extremely high risk in terms of potential policy failure um, and our, we're strongly recommending that the scheme should not commence until the maps are ready. Um, the detail of code-based clearing is now on exhibition and it covers the type of clearing activities listed on the slide here. The codes are actually quite complex to navigate. The, I mean, I know the landholders and farmers wanted a simplified system, but if you read them, they're actually quite difficult to understand in parts. And it's, it's kind of assumed that correct application will be assessed by local land services at the notification or certification stage. Um, there's no scientific underpinning in the codes. For example, the set-aside ratios are very arbitrary. They're just set numbers. Uh, and there are several avenues for removing potentially high-value vegetation, such as paddock trees or trees with hollows. Uh, and as we noted previously, this is contrary to the objectives of the Biodiversity Conservation Act to protect that kind of vegetation. Um, 
as feared, the amounts of allowable clearing, particularly in the last two types of codes, the equity code and the farm code, are significantly high and actually equate to broad scale clearing. For example, under the equity code, you can clear up to 625 hectares or 25% of the vegetation on a property in the first three years. And in the farm-based code, the, the set-aside areas don't actually need to be established vegetation. They can be on cleared land and they can just be replanting. However, as noted, there has, there has been some progress uh, on what cannot be cleared under a code, and this is really important. It's through the mapping of the sensitive land category um, that there is some limit being set, but it's really important there is still more tightening that needs to be done to risk, to avert the risk that this type of clearing will actually undermine the obje objectives of the whole scheme. Um, for instance, as I said, the codes still allow clearing of endangered ecological communities. Um, and there are larger set-aside ratios for such clearing. If under a code you clear an EEC, well, according to the detail, you just have to set aside more of it. However, when you dig further into the detail, there's again discretion for these requirements to be reduced on non, non or discounted on non-environmental grounds. There's also um, some detail missing in terms of the code. There are four blank schedules at the end. Uh, so in terms, a bit more detail <coughs> on, on limits in the codes. The documents on exhibition set some limits. For example, codes can't be used on certain small holdings or where there's actually less than 10% of vegeta vegetated land. So there's less, less than 10% of your land is actually mapped yellow. These limits should be strongly supported and expanded. And similarly, we strongly support the requirements for notification and especially mandatory certification prior to clearing. This is going to be really crucial in the interim period that LLS has some idea of what's happening, especially in this short term while the maps are sti still getting done. There's also a clause in there that is good about not stacking the use of codes and exemptions to try and um, reduce the cumulative effect. So it's unclear also, my other point, it's unclear what the public access to the register of set aside areas will be. So under codes, landholders may be required to set aside areas, but it will actually be up to the discretion of local land services whether there's access, public access to what this register is. We think it should be at least equivalent to the current, current native vegetation register. So I don't finish on an entirely depressing note of code-based clearing. The new biodiversity conservation regulation does set out further detail regarding new private land conservation scheme, so where the money is supposed to go and how the outcomes for biodiversity are to be achieved. So part five of the biodiversity conservation regulation identifies eligible land for biodiversity stewardship sites. Uh, it's got details around being a fit and proper person to do biobanking or the new equivalent of biobanking. It's got variation processes and so forth. These provisions are similar to the biobanking provisions except there's a few new ones relating to when stewardship site can be revoked for mining. Part 6 details how credits can be created and how the <coughs> biodiversity stewardship fund will be administered. As we've said throughout, we strongly support incentives for private land conservation. Uh, this in part depends on generating fair prices for biodiversity credits to ensure enough money to fund long-term management. Concerns about this combined with the weaker standards in the BAM that Nari noted greatly increases the risk of poli policy failure in terms of failing to achieve biodiversity conservation outcomes if enough money does not in fact flow to this part of the scheme. The missing piece of detail here is also, of course, the priority investment strategy, and that's going to determine where a lot of the money goes, and that is not yet developed. As the timeline at the beginning showed, uh, there will be further consultation after the scheme commences on some of the missing pieces of this regulatory detail. So this slide reiterates some of the strengths and weaknesses I noted at the start. Uh, and note some of the things that we will be focusing on in our submission. Um, as I said, these slides are going to go online and we're also aiming 
put our submission up early so you can see the specific recommendations in relation to, to clauses. As I said, there are some bits that need to be supported because they are some they do form safeguards in the system and that includes the accreditation, um, having clear thresholds, some of the compliance and monitoring tools and of course the details around the funding of private land conservation. Uh, but as, as we've said, we'll be concentrating on the problems with the mapping, trying to expand and get the most accurate maps possible, especially for the sensitive regu regulated land category, and also strongly saying that the scheme should not commence till the maps are ready. Um, we want to try and limit the equity and farm planning code, tighten offset variation rules, and delete the discounting discretions that are throughout and restrict options to pay money in lieu of actually finding offsets because that's a bit of a get out of jail free card and uh, we want to strengthen the standards in the BAM and the calculator. As we said we've got some of our technical experts at the moment working on these particular tools because unless you know you're a mathematically minded person or you have an economics degree the offsets calculator is very difficult to understand but our preliminary analysis of that for example shows that they're not actually factoring in scarcity in the price of increasingly rare offsets. Things like that sound very technical but they're actually extremely important for this scheme because if you don't actually get accurate prices then I don't know how you're going to have the funding to deliver the biodiversity outcomes. So even though it is a bit tedious to dive into this detail, it's really important that if you have a chance you have a look at how this is all going to fit together and how this is going to work. So that is part of the role of EDO, Nari and I and the Law Reform team, our scientific director, our technical um, expert panel, we're all working on this and we will have our submission out early 